Welcome, age of vintage society. Hollywood has seen its fair share of scandalous affairs that have rocked the industry. Ava Gardner was legendary for her beauty, her classic Hollywood films and her tumultuous love life. She won the hearts of movie audiences and some of Hollywood's most famous leading men. Ava was a knockout, possibly the sexiest woman ever to grace a movie screen. Why was Ava Gardner Hollywood's most alluring femme fatale? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Ava Gardner, the firecracker femme fatale. Ava Gardner knew how to pose for the camera. She'd slit her eyes, throw her head at an angle, and the photographer would somehow catch something about her, not elegance or grace exactly, but something that was strong, sexual and almost animal, as if she were zeroing in on you, weighing your merits and readying to pounce. And for most of the 40s and 50s, she was Hollywood's most alluring femme fatale, an image solidified both on and off the screen. Those eyes, those exotic made-for-stardom eyes, the way they slit lustily for the lens, the way they are crowned by devilishly perfect brows, can do strange things to a mere mortal man. They're mesmerizing, penetrating, wounding. They could well be sizing you up and saying, Go ahead, big guy, I dare you to make a move. The word beautiful isn't bold enough to encompass Ava Gardner. To say Ava Gardner was beautiful is to say Frank Sinatra had a nice voice, or Picasso did a pretty good job with oils. No, Ava Gardner went beyond beautiful into the realm of grandeur, or, as People magazine proclaimed after her death in 1990, she was the last goddess. And to think those exotic made-for-stardom eyes were made down home in Grabtown, where tobacco grows and the horizon is no higher than the tallest loblolly pine. Ava Gardner was, in the words of second husband Artie Shaw, the most beautiful creature you ever saw. She was also, according to co-star Deborah Carr, funny and rich and warm and human. But Gardner also had a wandering spirit, with a reckless streak and an insatiable appetite for booze and boys that would often lead to the most glamorous sort of disaster. Her life was filled with lust, love and late-night shenanigans. There was her long entanglement with a snooping Howard Hughes, as well as flings with bullfighters Robert Taylor, Mel Torme, David Niven, John F. Kennedy, Steve McQueen, an abusive George C. Scott, and an unsuccessful attempt to lure Robert Stack into a foursome. He suddenly got a stomachache. And then there was her beloved Francis, Gardner's third husband, Frank Sinatra. Their fights were legendary, and their make-ups loud. This straightforward sassy broad would challenge and terrify both men and women her entire life, including supposed tough guy Robert Mitchum, her former flame and co-star. Years after their onset affair, a friend would tell Mitchum that Gardner was arriving shortly. Ava Gardner? No, no, don't tell her I'm here, Mitchum apparently replied. If I get together with Ava, I'm done for. The shining star the world knows as Ava Lavinia Gardner had a holiday beginning, born Christmas Eve 1922, the youngest of seven children. As sparkly as her life would become, it had a most Spartan start. Her father, Jonas Gardner, was a hard-up tenant farmer. Ava's girlhood home is about eight miles southeast of Smithfield. The two-storey farmhouse where she was born and spent the first two years of her life still stands, and is still lived in at the corner of Grabtown and Avenue Roads. The view from the porch is much the same too. Farm fields flecked with flue-cured tobacco barns and edged by piney woods. When fire destroyed the family's barn and cotton gin, the gardeners moved to the nearby Teacherage, a boarding home for women teachers at the local Brogdon School, where Ava's mum worked as a cook and housekeeper. Her father, stripped of his farm property, later died of bronchitis when Ava was 15 years old. As a teenager, Ava was quite the head-turner, especially on those summer days at Holtz Lake, when swim attire accentuated her physique. At 17, Ava took the train to New York City to visit her older sister Beatrice, 
who was 19 years her senior and married to a professional photographer named Larry Tarr. Tarr clicked off glamour shots of his sister-in-law and displayed them in his studio window. A moon-eyed passerby who wanted a date with that teen angel in the window suggested sending the shots to the MGM Film Studios. Tarr figured, why not? Ava might have been content to carry on with secretarial classes back home in North Carolina, get married, raise a family and cook great fried chicken like her mother did, but MGM saw an exquisiteness that begged to be in pictures. The talent scouts called her back up to the big city for an interview and screen test. Ava's mother had her misgivings, as a mother would, but the baby of the family went out for her big audition. Her southern drawl was thicker than Clark Gable's hair tonic. Nobody could much understand her, and bless her heart, she was just plain awkward on screen. Acting? Well, it needed work. And those eyes, those mesmerising, penetrating, wounding eyes, they laser-beamed through every soul in the room, a flash of hypnotic fire. Realising that Gardner couldn't act and couldn't speak in a way that people north of the Mason-Dixie line could understand, the New York office arranged for her to shoot a silent screen test. She looked to the left, she looked to the right, then she walked around just enough to show off a spectacular pair of legs, purportedly prompting the MGM bosses in Hollywood to exclaim, She can't act, she didn't talk, she's sensational, get her out here! Gardner was signed to a standard seven-year contract at $50 a week, but that didn't mean she was a star. MGM signed hundreds of beautiful girls every year to similar contracts. Some would go on to make varsity, and some were just there to share private moments to the coaches, as it were. Gardner was somewhere between these two, given walk-on roles in B pictures but rarely allowed to speak, even as she slaved to rid herself of her southern twang. When not playing a pretty face in the background, the publicity officer made ample use of her looks, putting her in the publicity materials for films in which she may or may not have appeared. She also posed for a ton of leg art, aka pinups, which the studio would print en masse and use in generalised publicity campaigns. These pinups required Gardner to pose in all sorts of weird and faux sexy ways. What's even more fascinating than air humping, however, is that Gardner was stuck as a B-girl despite the fact that she was married to the biggest star at MGM, bigger than Clark Gable, bigger than Joan Crawford. For when Gardner arrived on the studio lot in 1941, she had become the immediate target of one Mickey Rooney, who, at all of 21, had been Hollywood's biggest box office draw for three years running. Even in the midst of performing, Rooney noticed the befuddled beauty and made a beeline for her in his clomping high heels. Everything in me stopped, he would write in his memoir, my heart, my breathing, my thinking. He may have been far from a hottie, but he had quite the reputation for his sexual exploits, and he honed in on Ava Gardner with an animalistic fervour. He asked her out on a date. He was so not her type. He asked again and again, and again, and again, and again. Finally, likely out of pure exhaustion, she said, well, all right. Then came the huge diamond ring. Then came the Hollywood marriage. Then 17 maddening months later came the Hollywood divorce. Then came two more Hollywood marriages to band leader Artie Shaw, she was wife number five out of eight, and to crooner Frank Sinatra, only to end in two more Hollywood divorces. She called Sinatra the love of her life, despite their unholy matrimony of cheating, fighting and much martini drinking. The legendary love story of Gardner and her inner Murato Frank Sinatra began with a bang. In the fall of 1949, the very married and very drunk Sinatra convinced an equally inebriated Gardner to leave a Palm Springs party hosted by studio head Daryl Zanuck with him. They sped into the night until they reached the quiet town of Indio. After a sloppy make-out session, Sinatra brought out two guns and began to shoot out street lights. A titillated Ava joined suit and shot out the window of a hardware store. The night ended with the pair brought into the station by armed cops, who were then paid off by the studio. 
She was the very embodiment of femme fatale, mysterious, dangerous, brutally blunt, irresistible. Men, regardless of their money and might, pursued her at their own peril. Consider the intense courting from eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes. The two never married, but she ended up smashing a marble ashtray on his head in one famous fight, knocking him flat out and nearly killing him. Gardner had always been a fighter. She and Hughes had thrown things at each other all the time, and she and Shaw routinely got into screaming matches. But she and Sinatra fought on an entirely different level, in part because Gardner's career was soaring while Sinatra's was hanging around in the toilet. Obviously, this was a recipe for disaster. It's like Gardner was the gorgeous high-powered CEO going off to make millions every day, and Sinatra was the mopey yet talented boyfriend who sat at home in his underwear eating cereal with whiskey for breakfast. The fact that she had already gone not just one husband only helped to amplify the image, as did the string of similarly femme fatalish roles that followed. This girl had a devilish look in her eye, was clearly bad news, could drink you under the table, and could steal every man in sight. But oh my, actual God, was she beautiful! Despite her love-hate relationships with some of the most famous men of the 20th century, Hollywood would have a long, prosperous marriage to Ava Gardner. The camera loved her unconditionally, and by extension, America loved her. After her breakthrough 1946 movie, The Killers, she became a box office go-to girl. She was in pin-ups, she was on the cover of Time, she was in movies with the biggest hunks in Hollywood – Clark Gable, Gregory Peck, Burt Lancaster, Cary Grant, Humphrey Bogart. Not bad for a girl who grew up eating her mother's fried chicken and saying yowl down on Grabtown Road. Her picture was all over the fan magazines, while her personal life and stream of boyfriends provided ample dish for the gossip columns. Whichever was the cause, MGM realised it had a huge star on its hands, immediately casting her in a string of pictures and donning her the second look girl. Ava never made a big fuss about her life in the limelight. Why, she never even wanted to put on lipstick when she was home, and she certainly didn't want to dress up. She was never in front of the mirror primping. To sum her up, when she was around family, she was family. Gardner first met patrician Grace Kelly, the future Princess of Monaco, on the sultry, sexually charged Kenyan set of Magambo in 1952. The outwardly uptight Kelly was initially appalled by Gardner and tag-along Sinatra's antics in the tent that the cast and crew shared, telling one friend, Ava is such a mess it's unbelievable. But Gardner's free-spirited sense of fun soon won over Kelly, who also began a passionate affair with hard-drinking leading man Clark Gable. Soon Kelly was trying to keep up with her co-stars. After a few drinks, she usually ended up turning pink and running into the bushes to vomit. The two beauties took a madcap trip to Rome, Kelly now suffering a severe case of hero worship. Gardner apparently insisted they visit a brothel, and an intrigued Kelly went along. By the end of the tour, the demure Grace Kelly had even found a boyfriend at one place and had dragged him into the back seat of the taxi for some heavy necking. Gardner and Kelly would remain friends for the rest of their lives. The princess would even attempt to set up her friend with Greek tycoon Aristotle Onassis, who she claimed was a very forceful lover. Gardner was decidedly grossed out by Onassis, though. She whispered to Grace that not even a good whipping could make her change her mind, and slipped away. And here's where Gardner's life takes a sweet turn. She divorces Sinatra and moves permanently to Spain, which she had fallen in love with during the filming of Contessa. Having at this point appeared in no less than three Hemingway adaptations, Kilimanjaro, and as Lady Brett in The Sun Also Rises. She becomes BFF with Papa himself. Hemingway introduces her to all sorts of bullfighters, the hottest of whom she seduces full-on, Lady Brett style. She accompanied Hemingway to his villa in Cuba, and after skinny dipping in the pool, Hemingway ordered his staff, the water is never to be emptied. Gardner continued to appear in films through the 60s, most notably The Night of the Iguana, where she hung out with Dick and Liz and 5,000 paparazzi, and The Bible, where she drove George C. Scott so mad with desire that he had to be locked inside his trailer. 
Like the other sirens of the classic era, she slowly faded into obscurity, eventually resorting to appearances on Knott's Landing and obscure low-budget films in order to pay the bills. It was in London where the shining star the world knew as Ava Lavinia Gardner withered up and flickered out. After a lifetime of smoking and hard living, she suffered from emphysema and, in 1986, suffered two strokes that left her paralysed and bedridden. On January 25, 1990, terribly weakened by pneumonia, she died at the age of 67. Ava Gardner lit the world on fire with her breathtaking beauty and fiery spirit. She was raised as a farmer's daughter near Smithfield. She transformed herself into a Hollywood starlet, a crooner's wife and a legacy. The world will never forget her, and we will never stop remembering she was ours. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Ava Gardner? Even the most beautiful and celebrated and vital lives eventually come to an end.